Kirk Bowman and John Wilcox. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. Thanks. It is a pleasure to be with you. I'm super excited to talk about your recent book, Reimagining Global Philanthropy. And we're going to be talking about philanthropy, of course, and, and new perspectives, new approaches to how we can go about doing this and doing this more effectively with greater social impact. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about it in relation to organizations and how organizational leaders um, can embed meaning and purpose into their organization and into the work of their people by connecting with these types of social impact uh, efforts, uh, both locally, domestically, and globally. As we get started, I wanted to share the bios of our guests with the listeners. Kirk Bowman is a full professor at John Wilcox's term chair of global development and identity at global, Pol at global politics in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Institute of Technology. Bowman previously was the founder and director of a nonprofit based in Fiji that combined drug discovery and local sustainable development in small Fijian coastal communities. He is currently working on several book projects, including one with John on a new model of international nonprofit organizations that maximize efficiency and outcomes for young people. John Wilcox is the co-founder and former CEO and director of California Republic Bank. California Republic Bank was one of the fastest growing and most successful de novo banks in California history. He has been and remains an active early stage investor in numerous companies and industries, including computer technology, media products, biotechnology, and financial services. Wilcox current and prior board affiliations include South Coast uh, Repertory, Junior Achievement, Very Special Arts, West Side Center for Independent Living, and Fiji Reef Resources. What a tremendous background uh, that both of you have, uh, wonderful expertise, uh, diverse perspectives that you bring to the table and combine uh, in your collaborative works. I think it's wonderful. And as we were talking about in the pre-interview, I'm joining you uh, from south of Salt Lake City in Orem. And both of you actually uh, were roommates just up the street in Provo uh, during your time as students at Brigham Young University. It's a small world. It's a pleasure to connect and to have a chance to chat. Anything else either or both of you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? Uh, just add that, you know, Kirk and I, uh, as you mentioned, were roommates in college and where we really connected and was really the beginning of the journey that we started as Washington, D.C. We we both did internships um, when we were at, at, at BYU and I was wearing a suit and tie at the Securities and Exchange Commission and Kirk was wearing jeans and a T-shirt uh, on the Council of Western Hemispheric Affairs, so which was a liberal think tank at, at the time. So. Really, it began where Kirk and I have, as we, you mentioned earlier, he's a professor and I'm a banker, and we come from these two completely different perspectives, but we've remained friends for almost 40 years now. So, uh, you know, the friendship and open-mindedness is really the, the key in the beginning of our journey. Yeah, that's excellent. And Kirk, anything you would like to add? I'm just, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and I think that that what John just said is really one of the key for the work that we've done together is that we have completely different experiences. I remain probably much more progressive or liberal than John. Um, and, and in this day when people are so uh, cloistered with people who think like they do and they don't communicate and they just lash out, I think we get a lot further in all sorts of endeavors if we sat down and empathetically listened to people who disagreed with us. Yeah, well said. And that's, a, that's another topic that would you know, be super interesting to explore. So your, your diverse backgrounds and perspectives, uh, different kind of worldviews and, and underarching foundational kind of ideologies might differ, but you can come together, you can have uh, meaningful conversation, meaningful collaborations, and really strive to make a difference in the world uh, in, in a way uh, that's going to connect with more people because you bring different uh, perspectives to the table. So I think that's wonderful. Uh, and your, in your book, Reimagining Global Th Th uh, Philanthropy, it's interesting because, again, you have an academic background, you have a, a financial services banking background um, coming at this similar problem of philanthropy, global um, need, social impact, those sorts of topics. Why did you feel the need to, to write this book and why did you frame it in terms of reimagining? What's in my mind that, that presupposes that 
the current way we think about philanthropy is a bit broken, and perhaps there's a different way we can do it um, to, to increase our impact. So maybe you can start by talking a little bit about that. We worked together on this project in Fiji, and we did philanthropy in the traditional way, where we had these great ideas, and we found the local stakeholders, and we brought the outside money, and we had all this Western expertise from the biggest universities in the world. Um, and we started to work and we had really great projects and they turned out to be all failures. Um, and so we had to look in the mirror and say, what is it if you have such a great idea, why does it fail? And we looked at a bunch of examples and it, we, we discovered that almost all of these Western led projects to lift up the locals and civilize them and bring them development end up as failures. Um, and so we had to reimagine for ourselves if we wanted to have an impact in the world. Um, and this is where we had one of our big epiphany moments is John as a banker, um, he could look at us and say, well, of course they fail because almost all startups fail. And you're essentially doing a startup in a country where you don't have any uh, kinship relations, you don't understand the culture, um, you don't understand the bureaucracy. And so everything is likely to fail. And so that's why we are reimagining first for ourselves. Um, and, and then we decided to write the book. Yeah, I mean, great intentions. I mean, you know, as a community banker, we would never lend money to a startup because as Kirk just mentioned, you know, a majority of the startups fail. Great intentions, good ideas, could be well capitalized, but they're still a, a significant failure, right? So when we really started looking in the numbers and doing our research, it wasn't a huge surprise to us when we really realized that a majority of nonprofits fail. You know, great intentions. You want to start a tilapia farm in Fiji, but you don't know anything about tilapia and you've never been to Fiji. So it, it, it's... It's, it's just typical of starting a startup restaurant. And so really what we did was start searching out for these already organically started successful nonprofits in the global South. And if we just invest in those people and take the startup risk out of the equation, then your results or your impact goes up, you know, multiplies. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. And it's, it's also interesting we've all lived in Utah County in, in uh, Utah. And this is one of the nonprofit like meccas of the world. We have more nonprofits per capita <laughs> here. So because we have, we have so many really well-meaning, thoughtful people that have time and want to give back and, and to contribute. And what ends up happening is you have really great intentions, even really intelligent people, but they don't really have expertise in particular in the area that they're trying to, to uh, make a difference. And instead of like scanning the environment, looking around to see what organizations already exist that are trying to do what they wanna do, they just try to reinvent the wheel. They try to start something from scratch. Um, and assuming they even have all of the, the competencies to be able to do it successfully, like you said, you know, you just think of it from a startup perspective, of course, so many are gonna fail. And especially when you have such a saturated market uh, for, of do-gooders that, you know, want to make a difference, you, you have to do something else and you have to connect uh, to the existing organizations that have figured things out. You add to that, uh, as uh, Kirk was describing, you know, one, one way of framing that is, is kind of this white savior complex. You have the Western um, white people going into the global South and get their, they, they know all the answers, they're going to fix everything. And even when you have good intentions and you go in and you want to try to talk to the locals and you want to try to connect with key stakeholders and do those sorts of things, it's, a, it's just a fundamentally kind of different starting point um, that often leads to failure than if we, we go in rather than assuming we have the answer, going in and just uh, doing the research on the ground, trying to take a systems perspective to understand the issues at play and involve people who have experience with the culture, with the local regulations and economy and labor force and all of that involving them at every stage, your, your chances for success go way, way up. So when we're, again, when we're talking about impact, this is, this is a separate question from intention. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, some people don't even have the intention. So we start there and we talk about the need and we talk about, you know, why this is a good thing to be involved in, but lots of people have the intention and intention in and of itself isn't enough. So, 
um, a good heart, a big heart and good intentions needs to be coupled with skills and competencies and, and a thoughtful, uh, impactful approach. So as we couple these things together, the, the, the opportunity for impact goes up exponentially. Um, and, I, and we, were, we are going to connect this back into the workplace a bit because we know uh, there's lots of research that talks about the role of meaningful work, uh, employees having a chance and opportunity to give back to their communities to make an impact in the world and do things that are significant. We know how that helps to attract and retain really great people, to engage people, to unlock their creativity and their innovation. So more and more organizations even have their own philanthropic arm of the organization that undertakes a lot of these types of projects and activities, or they partner with other existing NGOs uh, to and, and pairing their, their uh, employees up with meaningful opportunities to, to contribute as a means of both impact, but also of just employee engagement and just making people happier to be working where they're working. Um, so we'll come back to that. We'll talk a little bit more about more about that. But before we do, um, what else from the, your book do you think is, is important to, to lay out for listeners in terms of some of the key learnings and the key takeaways? I, I think one of the main takeaways from our book is the need for us to really re-examine what are the motivations that we have um, and how we balance the benefits to our ego, our dating profiles, our uh, resume, et cetera, on the one side and the praise and all the incentives from universities um, to uh, the corporate world to churches is to start something that has your name on it um, and often to use technology um, and then in the global south with this white man's burden mentality, when things go wrong and fail, um, the default is that you blame the locals. It was something defective about their culture. Um, the people were lazy. That's They couldn't accept innovation. They were slow to use technology. And so we, we really um, absorb part of that white man's burden of, of blaming the uncivilized, uncultured, um, people in the global south. Um, and what we discovered is if you want to have the greatest impact and you're not worried about the praise and the glory um, and the job prospects, et cetera, then the best is to try and be an anonymous sidekick because these communities, they need role models that don't look like us three. These communities in the global south need role models who look like the kids in those neighborhoods. Um, and we can uh, just kind of take away all of the, the glory and praise and celebrity as we come in as this, you know, bushwhacking uh, uh, person from the global north. So we need to be sidekicks instead of superheroes. And, and just take that not only from the global south, where we believe, believe in investing and finding local superheroes, there's also local, there's local superheroes all over the world and b both in Salt Lake and our own backyards. And as a banker, you know, we're compelled to invest in our community through the Community Reinvestment Act. And, and, and we would never as a banker tell somebody how to run their business. We would find somebody who's already operating a successful model and give them debt or leverage to do more of the same. And it's really the same kind of model. You find these local superheroes are already doing the heavy lifting already know what they're, you know, in many cases, these people were born to do this. They, 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 it's their dream to help others. And you find these people and you invest in them uh, and your results, your impact go way up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's a hard thing because so much of the world of philanthropy, especially historically is you you big you run big galas. You invite a bunch of wealthy people. Uh, you invite them to to donate money, and it it is largely ego driven. I mean, you, you're trying to shine a light on people and their contributions and put their name on things. Um, and you know, there's don't get me wrong. Like I, I'm all for people donating, and if they can get some credit and and get their name on a building or something, you know, fine. I, I like people sharing their wealth. Um, but your point about getting your your ego out of it, like you, you're you're a supporting sidekick to it. It's not about us. It's about the need we're trying to 
uh, to, to support or to help with, right? So if I'm going into another community, it's not about me at all. I, I might be a tool and a mechanism to, to, to contribute, um, but I, I shouldn't fall into the trap of making it about me. And, you know, the people I surround myself with on my team, they need to have similar mentalities. And, and when that doesn't happen, you do see uh, a lot of reinventing the wheel just so you can put your own little spin on it and claim innovation and claim that you're a genius, um, those sorts of things. I see it all the time. And even if we get out of the realm of philanthropy and social impact, and we just talk about within organizations, new, uh, new innovations, new initiatives, new programs, things that can help drive success for your teams and for your, your institution, um, I, I see it so often when I'm working with executives and with organizations where it's it's a completely ego driven thing. They 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 yeah. they are under investing in already established, super successful initiatives and programs, and then they're throwing money towards completely brand new things that are, in essence, completely reinventing the wheel. Um, also, that they can claim credit, and it's 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 incredibly wasteful. Uh, it's incredibly demoralizing to employees when they're in an organization where leaders do that. Um, and, and there's just so many negative uh, impacts. So again, if we're trying to drive yeah. meaningful social change, let's, let's do it in a way that makes sense. Yeah, it's completely inefficient. I mean, Kirk and I, we, we, we found a church in the global South that gets painted four times a year by four different church groups. And meanwhile, there's two unemployed painters in town. You know, it, it just, it, it's a complete waste of time and money and that can never really be impactful. And, and, and as we talked earlier, I mean, even in Silicon Valley, where you've got the most well-capitalized, biggest ideas by the smartest and brightest people, there's a giant failure rate. Yeah. And, and why does that church get painted over and over and over again, while the locals don't even have an opportunity to like support themselves and their families? It's, it's so people like us have a chance to go and travel and feel like we're doing right. something good. So it's about patting ourselves yeah. on the back rather than actually making a difference in the communities we're going to. Yeah, there's a website. Yeah, there's a there's a website ahead, called Kurt. the Humanitarians of Tinder. And <laughs> it shows all the people who use these, what are really quite ghastly photos of some blonde woman from the global north and three emaciated, you know, black children in the global south. Um, and it becomes even even worse. You know, you can imagine how many people are going around collecting money to do orphanage tourism, when in reality, 80% of all the orphans are not really orphans, but there's a supply of orphan tourism and there's so much money in these networks and these programs um, that send orphanage tourists that th there is human trafficking of orphans to satiate our needs to go and hold uh, an orphan, take a picture, and then do tourism for a week and act like we're a big philanthropist. Yeah. Well, and then you get to write it off on your taxes as well. On the top, on top of all that, it's a write-off. So you get a fifty per. You, know, you get Joe Biden to pay for fifty percent of your trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Okay. So we have just about five, six minutes left before we wrap up. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can connect some of the principles and learnings from your book back into organizations. So if I, I'm a, say I'm a team lead or I'm a middle management manager or, or executive, I have a group of people that I'm responsible for. I know that they're hungry for meaning and purpose and fulfillment, and they want to make an impact. They want their work to matter. Okay. So how can I utilize um, the types of concepts that are in your book in a way that uh, can get them involved with meaningful stuff uh, that will not only allow them to have an actual meaningful impact, but also help them to be more fulfilled in their daily work. So they come more motivated, more energized, more committed to the organization. Well, I can tell you from my standpoint, I was a former CEO, as you mentioned in my bio of California Republic Bank. I'm, I'm also currently on the board of Mechanics Bank, which is almost a $19 billion bank headquartered in Walnut Creek. And and I can firsthand see how serving in your own community, which is what we would say, f identify your local superheroes. And, you know, as I mentioned, as a banker, we're compelled to invest in our local communities and get people out. But I can s tell you that I've seen the positive 
uh, impact in, in the employee and in the organization when you really feel like you are part of the organization, you're giving, giving back and you're, and you're, you're getting these rewards. And, and as, a, as a former CEO, I could just say that when it comes to my own results uh, on, on the bottom line of the P&L, having people not only focused internally on the organization, but giving back uh, actually really drives positive, better results than not. Because, you know, everybody at the end of the day, there's some person in your neighborhood that is always going above and beyond the call of duty to make an impact. And if you can just find those people and give them a little money, uh, your results uh, are, are way up. And, and the reality is, that's the thing. When you give money, you want great impact. The last thing you want to do is when you give a hundred dollars to find out that 90 cents out of that dollar went to overhead, you know, and it didn't really get to the intended recipient. So by knowing the local people and investing in them, you can be assured that your impact is, is, is going to happen. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Kirk, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think that one of the biggest problems in all organizations right now is this high degree of cynicism. And what we discovered is that if you're working with these local superheroes who are organic leaders from these neighborhoods that somehow were born with the leadership gene and to watch them work and how you can help transform their communities by being this sidekick, it really melts away your cynicism and every type of organization would do better to have that type of feeling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, John and Kirk, it has just been a real pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in just a few minutes, but before we wrap up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, find out uh, where they can find your book, etc. And then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, our website for the book is reimagine.care, uh, www.reimagine.care. And um, we have a lot of great features on our website. Um, for example, we made uh, six documentary films, um, one hour each with Katya Lund, who was the co-director of City of God. They've been in a lot of film festivals, festivals and won awards. And we also have the trailers and the full films there. And if you just watch a couple of these trailers about these organization, everything clicks and people really understand um, in, a, in a great way the message that we have. Um, and they can order the book through there or Amazon or um, through their local book, book dealer. And I would just add that we, Kirk and I did and have started a, a, a nonprofit, a 501c3 called Rise Up and Care. And you can uh, uh, look at that called riseup.care. Kirk and I cover all the overhead. Um, so a hundred cents out of every dollar goes to the intended recipients that we support in the global South. As you, as Kirk mentioned, you can look at the documentaries, you can see firsthand these local superheroes in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro and what amazing work they're doing. Excellent. Thank you both. It has been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what John and Kirk can do for you. Check out their book, check out these videos, these documentaries. There is a tremendous world of need out there. Every community has pain points. Every community needs more support. And there are these complex, persistent social problems and ills uh, that aren't going to go away. They require us to make a concerted effort from a holistic systems perspective uh, in order to make a difference. And, and our people in our organizations want to be part of that change. They want to be part of that impactful difference. So let's find ways to make that happen. I think this book will be a great resource for that. Thank you, John and Kirk. It's been a pleasure. I hope listeners get connected. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. <laughs>